After God had carried us safe to New England, and we had builded our homes, provided necessaries for our livelihood, reared convenient places for God's worship, and settled the civil government, one of the next things we longed for and sought after was to advance learning and perpetuate it to posterity. Dreading to leave an illiterate ministry to the churches when our present ministers shall lie in the dust. In the spirit of these words, the General Court of Massachusetts, in honor of John Harvard, education's Puritan benefactor, established the first college in America at Cambridge in 1636. They named it Harvard College. To the Puritans, religion and education were inseparable. The Bible was law. To interpret the law, all men must be able to read. To read, they must be educated. So, for little folk, education began in the home. It began with the few books that had been brought from England. The family Bible, which every man needed to learn and read for his soul's salvation. The catechism that tested a man's knowledge of his faith and the Bible. an occasional copy of one of the classics in some of the more learned families. And for beginners, a special little book called The Horn Book, usually a child's first introduction to reading. This single page, protected by a covering of horn, contained an alphabet, a benediction, and a prayer. Another book usually found in this collection was the New England Primer, which said, In Adam's fall we sinned all. And the only remedy was, Thy life to mend, God's book attend. And to attend it was the goal of education in the church, in the schools, and in the home. One of the ministers in the Puritan church, Cotton Mather, in describing a family well-ordered, had said, Above all, instruction should lead to salvation by means of Bible reading, the catechism, public worship, and continuing religious teaching at home by the parents. A child's first training outside the home came in the kitchen of a neighbor who kept a dame school. In communities where this was the only school, the child might attend from a few weeks to a year. And for a few pennies a week, she taught them the little she knew about numbers and letters while going about her household tasks. The girls were taught to cook and to sew, and the formal education of many girls ended with the completion of her sampler. It was a sample of the girl's domestic skills, the only diploma she would ever receive because most colonial schools and all colleges were closed to her. But for boys, the dame school gave the rudiments of instruction that preceded the reading and writing school. Here, religion was the core of the curriculum, and lessons were the ritual of the catechism with its questions and answers. Each boy was expected to be able to repeat the answers to every question, and be ready to respond immediately if the master stick pointed to him. The questions, they were the fundamental doctrine of the Puritan interpretation of Christianity. How did God make you? In my first parents, holy and righteous. Are you then born holy and righteous? No, my first parents sinned. Are you then born a sinner? I was conceived in sin and born in iniquity. What is your birth sin? Adam's sin imputed to me, and a corrupt nature dwelling in me. Thus ran the catechism, the first core curriculum in Puritan schools, and indeed much of their reason for being. The words of the catechism were a part of the most popular textbook of the colonial period, the New England Primer. From the primer, a boy learned letters, 
then syllables, and finally, words. Every word of its gloomy content was memorized and recited by heart. Obedience, conformity, and repetition were the staples of educational method. Examples were copied from a handwritten arithmetic, but they were not practical problems. In two months to three years of schooling, a boy learned reading, writing, spelling, and ciphering, the limit of education for the common man. This much education was made compulsory by the famous Massachusetts Law of 1642. This law also required all parents and masters to see that their charges learned to read and understand the principles of religion and the capital laws of this country. But it provided neither teachers nor schools for that purpose. In 1647, the old deluder Satan law was passed, requiring towns and communities to provide teachers and schools. Select men were required to supervise the schools and provide for public support. Each parent was charged in proportion to the number of children in the family. Thus, the two New England laws provided for compulsory education, including taxes provided for support and for supervision. A man with a big family, who could not pay in currency, would promise to supply logs for the school fire for a certain number of weeks. Poor children were admitted free. But only a few poor children could attend the Latin grammar school, a school for leadership and not for the masses. It took a boy from the dame school or the reading and writing school at the age of seven or eight, and by the age of 16, laid the classical foundation that prepared him for college. How well the Latin grammar school prepared him for admission to the colonial colleges can be judged by Harvard's early entrance requirements. When any scholar is able to understand Tully or such like classical Latin author extempore and make and speak true Latin in verse and prose and decline perfectly the paradigms of nouns and verbs in the Greek tongue, let him then and not before be capable of admission into the college. At the apex of the colonial educational system were the colonial colleges. They all started as small liberal arts colleges bearing no resemblance to the modern university. The purpose of all these colleges was to give classical and religious training. But some of them offered scientific as well as classical subjects. This was especially true of Pennsylvania. In these early schools, we can see the beginnings of our present educational system, the Dame School, equivalent to our kindergarten, the Reading and Writing School, which was the elementary school of the colonies, and the Latin Grammar School that prepared boys for college. This was the pattern of education in New England at the middle of the 18th century. But the middle colonies and southern colonies followed different patterns because of their different cultures. To the middle colonies came the Dutch to New Amsterdam, the Quakers to Pennsylvania, the Catholics to Maryland. Each family wanted instruction in its own religious faith. Family ties and language ties were too strong to be broken. Therefore, free school systems were not established in the middle colonies. For each family wanted a school that would train its children in its own particular faith. In this cloister at Ephrata, Pennsylvania, as early as 1732, Seventh-day Baptists had taught a writing school. Here, religious worship was held on Saturday, and during the week, children were taught the bold Gothic script that the school was noted for. 
Perhaps the greatest contribution the middle colonies made to education was the academy, a distinctly American institution that was the forerunner of the high school. The first academy was founded by Benjamin Franklin at Philadelphia in 1751 and soon became the University of Pennsylvania. From this unpretentious beginning, the academy rose steadily in popularity. Though high schools began in the early 1800s, the academy became the dominant secondary school in America by the 1850s. Toward the end of the century, the academy gradually gave way to the modern high school. The chief contributions of the middle colonies to the American educational system were academies and denominational schools. In the South, from the days of the earliest settlement at Jamestown, the Anglican colonies had left education to the Church of England. For poor children, the church maintained a pauper school, taught by the minister or a missionary of the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. Beyond this minimum schooling, the only opportunity for the poor was apprenticeship. Under a contract called an indenture, a boy was bound to serve his master until the age of 21. In return for the apprentice's services, the master was to teach him a trade, give him a home, and teach him to read and write. But often a master was more interested in the boy's services than in his education. In the lands of the South, large plantations developed. Towns were few and far between, and each plantation fulfilled most of the needs of its master, tenants, and slaves. Unlike the Puritans of New England, these people had not rejected the religious and educational customs of England. To them, the distance between social classes, like the distance between plantations, made private education both desirable and practical. The sons and daughters of planters were taught at home by tutors. In addition to the fundamentals, a girl learned the social graces and a boy learned authority. For the son of a planter might someday manage his father's plantation or become a member of the House of Burgesses. Here at the capital at Williamsburg and elsewhere throughout the colonies, there was talk of independence. Even the new editions of the New England Primer reflected the changing feeling toward the crown. The verse of the illustrated alphabet that had read, Our King the Good, no man of blood, became Kings should be good, not men of blood. There is no way of estimating the influence of colonial schools on revolutionary thought. In 1776, America moved from colonial status to independence. The United States became a nation with vast territories to be settled and divided into states. As land was ceded to the federal government, Congress provided for the orderly progress of the Northwest Territory toward statehood. The Ordinance of 1787 set aside the 16th section of every township for the support of education. The sale of these land grants formed the basis of school funds in most states west of the Alleghenies. So ended a century and a half of education marked by an intermixture of religious, civil, and private control, of apprenticeship, of plantation and pauper schools in the South, and denominational schools in the middle colonies. But the laws of New England had set a pattern that the new nation was later to follow, an example of compulsory education in public schools officially supervised and publicly supported. However, it took another century for this New England pattern to spread over the entire country and bring system 
to American education.